think the volume is. Ma, are you sure it's not your microphone? Yeah, it's, it's all the way up. Okay. I can't hear you. Can she hear you? Can you hear me? Are you there? All right, does, does anybody have any ideas why this? Can somebody okay, write Kayla, in why this? Kayla can hear you. Maya, can, all right, Maya's gone. Same thing with her audio. Well, this is embarrassing. You know I mean? Sometimes in life you have to just accept that you're an embarrassing person. Do you know any jokes? Uh, <laughs> I do know some jokes, but they're, they're not, you know, they're not PG is my problem, all my jokes. Um, all right, should I invite Maya again? This is so frustrating. That was so exciting to have her and see her face. Um, I'm inviting her again. Does Kayla have any advice? Yeah, it's for audio. Get up, people. All right, is it working now? I can hear you now. Yes, yes it's working now. Okay, great. So if you have this, the most embarrassing things ever happened to me in public is this me starting one and then you starting one and then me starting it again. It's really so awful. Well, if you think about it, if this is the most that ever happened, we're doing okay. We're doing okay. We're, doing, we're just, we're, we're, we're Luddites. We just don't know how the world works. I, I know. And we're trying to learn. We're trying to be decent people. We're trying to engage with the public in a meaningful, substantive way. Yes. A, that the public likes to be met, as you've so carefully taught me throughout yes. your life. I apologize to everybody who watched that. It's kind of like watching a slow motion. <laughs> Car accident. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Felt like, and um, I, it feels like I put my finger in electrical socket. I don't know what I'm scared of. I <laughs> public humiliation. Public humiliation. Public humiliation. That's for sure what we're scared of. Um. Well, let me say thank you. You hear me? <laughs> you for humiliating myself on your behalf. Yeah, I really appreciate it. You know, I great, mean, great, good. There's. You may not have noticed, but um, there's been this giant bomb that's went off in my life, which is that. Uh, my daughter is like a tremendous artist and everybody, if you sign on to talk with me, people want to listen to me. <laughs> For years, you had to tag along with paparazzi following up to your mother and I, and, and now you've just usurped us. You've lapped us. You're patting us on the ass as you run past. I have not done any of those things. And, and the implication that I might have is, is only going to make me look embarrassing. Um, but here, but okay. In that regard, though, you are now having to answer all kinds of questions in the public about things. But for, for years, I have had to answer questions about you. And the one that I get the most often is what um, is this question of what, what's the best advice you've ever given uh, me? And I always really struggle to answer that question because you just give me so much um, advice that I've requested. I request advice, but and then I, I get it. And so I, I kind of I was thinking about Paul and Joanne and what we should and how you've been talking about them as actors and as role models for um, young people in the world, trying to figure out how to be interesting, substantive artists and humans and lovers in this crazy, weird, broken world. And I was just thinking that I would, uh, I put, I organized some questions that I've asked you before, so I know the answers to them. So remember not to entertain me. Okay. Um, remember this is for the other people. Also remember that the other people are here and don't forget that they're here because yes. it's not a FaceTime, they're here. So don't say anything, you know. Right. Right. Yeah, right. don't forget. There's, there's 47,000 people listening. Um, well, a chalkboard in the sky, I understand. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but I'm gonna ask you some questions, okay? Right. Okay, I'm sure you've answered this before in Paul and Joanne Press, but I'm gonna ask it anyway, which is um, y you call this documentary uh, The Last Movie Stars. Mm -hmm. um, do you think they really are the last movie stars? And if the answer is yes, what do you think young people who wanna be actors or movie stars should aspire to be in terms of being at the top of their profession? What is the, what's the biggest goal? All right, first off, that the line isn't really my line. It's a, it's, their best friend was this writer, Gore Vidal, who won the National Book Award. He was an amazing leader in gay rights, in human rights, in forward thinking. He was extremely progressive 
individual who is crazy smart. And I actually met him with your mom on the set of Gattaca. Cool. And blew me away. And I remember sitting there at lunch with him and he would be talking about Paul and Joanne because he was their best friends. I mean, he was really close, intimate, you know. And he had this feeling that they were the last movie stars. And what he meant by it is they were the last generation to be raised the way the first generation of movie stars, Catherine Hepburn, Gary Cooper, people who came up in acting class with musical training, with voice and speech training, um, and were brought up in the studio system. And he was noticing how television and the expanse of how much entertainment is out there was changing things. I mean, you know this with the music business. The music business has been revolutionized because it's never been easier to record music and never been harder to get people to listen to it because there's so much. And the same is happening with movies. You know, when Cool Hand Luke came out, there were exponentially less films released that year than now. So the, the movie had a gravitas that is very difficult for movies to have now. But that said, I believe that every generation is the last of one thing and the first of another. Y you know, I mean, we could, y y you're the last, you're also the first, you know, and it's weird about living a long time as you start to watch some of the things that were behind you. A lot of my mentors um, are passing on now. You know, the, the generation above me knew Paul and Joanne, could be friends with them, saw plays with them, went to races with them. They took their kids to ballet together, you know, that generation is leaving us. And part of the idea of the last movie stars is to look at what they had to offer. So not as one tide goes out, we bring as much good stuff with us as we can. Ah, it totally makes sense. It also just made me think about like the movie theater going experience since the pandemic has become so much more rarefied that it does feel like there are these movies that come out in a year, whether or not it's like it's, a Marvel movie, it's Maverick, it's Elvis, where there are only a couple movies a year that make that kind of like blockbuster impact in the theaters that feel culturally significant to everyone. Where like everyone's like, hey, have you seen that? Have you seen that? I wonder if that is weirdly more similar. I mean, the movies- those Well, the pandemic has kind of thrust us backwards in time a little bit. Hasn't yeah. We're hanging out at home, going to the movie theater is a big deal. I mean, I think the first movie that really brought me back was Maverick. I mean, that was the first time and it was so fun to order popcorn and sit there in the air conditioning again. And it, it does make it more culturally revel relevant. On the flip side, your generation has this unbelievable option available to them. Is you guys can sit, if you're lucky enough to have Apple TV or have access to it, you have the entire canon of film history available to you. I do think it's a little overwhelming. It's yeah. Like, giant library and saying we well, can read whatever you want it's like uh where do i start i'd rather just you know let me go look at instagram you know i mean because it's yeah. overwhelming um okay next question very good answer um thank, thank you, you for, thank you for that contribution okay i passed to the next stage yes you passed the next stage the next stage is what do you think is the role of ego in the arts um some people say that your ego will destroy you and like you have to stay humble to be able to survive this business and other people will say that you need ego to be able to survive the sort of like vulnerability and hatred of putting your heart out into the universe um and having people rip it apart in front of you uh what where do you think the role of ego lives well that's a deep question because then you you have to have some kind of philosophy behind that like a a, a buddhist philosophy that is, that's kind of like the razor's edge. You know, you, you have to both have an ego and not have an ego. You have to do them both. Philip Seymour Hoffman used to say the people that he liked were the people who got to set and act like their life depended on doing a great job that day while sa simultaneously knowing that it's not rocket science, it's not heart surgery, and be able to laugh and understand that we're dreamers. You, you yeah. know, have to take it totally seriously and completely laugh at yourself. And you know the thing, oh, there's so many, I find that so interesting because it, if you don't have confidence, you, you can't do it. And if you have too much confidence, you have no humility and you don't understand that you're always a part of a team, whether you're playing music or whether you're acting, 
you're a part of a collective imagination. You know, I mean, I guess painters might act on, might do their art on their own, or uh, but. But you're, you're part of a tradition, a moment, and, and, and like with your other painters. You didn't invent the canvas. You didn't invent art galleries. You didn't invent the history of art. Yeah, tell the Wilco story. Tell the Wilco story. From Wilco has the best thing to say about it. Is like he was asked, like, what's it like to have a whole stadium sing along with you? And, you know, and like to be a rock god. And it and I'll paraphrase, please forgive me, but the, what the takeaway I took from his interview that I loved was, at first, it is this unbelievable high where you almost feel this kind of godlike status as you're at the center of a stadium and all this, this congregation around you until he had the intelligence to realize that he didn't invent rock and roll. He didn't invent the concert. He didn't invent the guitar. He didn't invent the GCA chord progression. He's, he's part of a long history and that the people aren't coming to see him. They're coming to see music, you know, and that music has been a power throughout the history of mankind and that he's just a player like every member of the audience. We're having this shared experience that's called a rock concert. And you want to sing along as much as I want you to sing along. And it's yeah. like a little dance. And when you get involved in that, then your confidence goes up because you realize that human beings love to watch other people take a dare and succeed. We love it. You know, you, you're at, at a swimming hole, you know, and, and there's like a rock 20 feet up and there's a little pool of water and you watch somebody have the guts to jump in it and they come out splashing and surviving. You just, it like makes you glad you're a human being. And the same is true when you watch Robert Plant sing or Jimi Hendrix rip a solo or you, you, know, you just feel like, how did you do that? And it makes you go, I love us. Like we're, yeah. We're awesome. That's all. Okay, that's great. The right, that's the right manifestation of ego, I think. Yeah, is confidence and the willing to embarrass yourself and like yeah. the willingness to be brave. And the thing about young people where you're at is that you can't have confidence, real confidence, without experience. And so you have to have the humility to understand that you don't have experience. And if you have the humility to say, I don't know, I don't know. Well, what'll happen then is you'll be able to learn. A lot of people, when they don't know something, the, the, the ego kicks in and they start pretending they know, or they know one tiny thing and they'll lean on it so hard. And then our insecurity gets manifest as arrogance, bravado, and then you start tripping all over yourself because you, you, it, it's not, you remember, I mean, I, I've told you this before, one of my first uh, act, when I was auditioning for my first Broadway play, the guy who ran the theater, uh, who was a former head of Juilliard, really interesting guy said, um, have you done anything before? And I said, well, you know, I did the, I played Romeo in the school production of this. I played, you know, I was full of this long list of credits. And he said, right, you've done nothing. You've never acted on stage. I was like, no, he goes, let's say that. You have no idea what you're doing. I was like, I have no idea what you're doing. He said, great. Now you're in a great place to learn because you do have some talent. And if you have some talent, we can work with it. Makes sense? That makes so much sense. And that feels like that's the beginner's mind thing of the best place to start is when you open your mind and don't think that you're the you know smartest person in the room or whatever. Um, Tabula Rasa thing is, is like, you. I, I I remember the first time I showed you how to shoot a bow and arrow and right to the target. You know, it's like, you're just, we're just goofing around there out at Charles Gaines's. Uh, I haven't hit a bullseye since. Yeah, but the first time when you go like, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know what I'm doing. And you pick it up and you kind of, your eye goes that, that, and then it works, but then you start thinking about it too much and you screw and it up. Yeah, you screw it all up. Okay, next question. Um, do you, Paul and Joanne were very um, political and they used their cultural in, in, um, influence to, attempt to positively influence and shape their time period to the best of their ability. Um, do you think that it's artists' responsibility to be political or just to contribute the best way that they know how? Um, like, do you think that if you have the self-awareness to know that you're stupid, you should not tell people what you think? Like, I, like what is, <laughs> in, terms of our, in terms of our relationship to um, people in the arts being, being um, these, these, you know, current present day political influencers, Paul and Joanne were some of the first artistic political influencers. And what, is, what do you think about that? 
it is a responsibility or is it just a possibility? I think you could make the, ex you could ask the exact same question and take out the word artist. I, I, I mean, the, I put in the documentary an amazing quote where MLK was being interviewed by, uh, with Paul Newman. It was an amazing side note story where Johnny Carson was a really interesting person and in the height of the civil rights movement, he offered a whole week of a show to Harry Belafonte and Harry Belafonte led it and they wanted to have all these civil rights conversations on the show, but they couldn't get any white stars to show up, right? Except Paul Newman came, I think three times. And so there's this clip of him being interviewed on stage with Martin Luther King and they get asked that question. And Martin Luther King says something incredibly wise, surprise, surprise, um, about that all of us were human beings before we had a profession. And whatever that profession is, and we have a responsibility to continue the development of that being, regardless of said profession. And some of us are political. And some people are not hardwired that way. It's very difficult for them, their brain, to engage in that. Paul, I think because he was Jewish, because he was a World War II veteran, had an awareness of what racism was, what injustice was, because he was obviously raised pretty well. He had a deep awareness. He said way before, you hear this a lot, but he said back in the early 60s, the luckiest thing that ever happened to him was being born white. He had an awareness of what systemic racism was and how he was put in this magnificent privileged position simply by his birth and time and place, right? And he never lost that. And so he felt the more successful he became, the more obligation he felt in trying to spread the wealth. And that, yeah. man that manifested finally when Paul and Joanne started Newman's Own and gave away hundreds of millions of dollars, but they to express their love and to share. But I don't know that th that's the long answer. The short answer is, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, an additional thought that I, th I think I've heard you say before, but is that it's only people who've reached a certain level of success, either have been born into it uh, and privileged, have been born into it or achieved it that are allowed to live apolitically. Like everyone, everyone un, like under the poverty line, everyone like who, if minorities and like are not allowed, are not given permission to live apolitically. Even if they're, if you're an artist, like yeah. you're, in, you're inherently, it's, it's an <laughs> obligation. So I, I think that there's, there's a def something to be said that uh, athletes, artists, um, what, are, like politicians. You're citizens that have a louder voice. And so I think in a way, a responsibility does fall on us. I, you know, we just saw Elvis and, and one of my, you know, for those people who don't know, I took my uh, honor, was it shortly after your 13th birthday to Graceland and we had an amazing experience, but I love Elvis, but I can't ever think hard on him without getting so disappointed that he didn't do more for black artists. You know, I just, I, and so history doesn't smile well on that decision. He completely ripped off and had a great love of all these magnificent musicians. He was getting his start with Sam Phillips, who's dedicated to, uh, cr you know, getting black music out into the world. And Elvis was a part of that and, and stole that. And he didn't really bring people along with him. Yeah. It's not like I think he's not allowed to sing those songs. I thought he sang the hell out of them. And it's, it's a great possible thing to do to unite us, to sing each other's songs and to be together. But it has to stay us. He's yeah. It doesn't stay us, it starts to be stealing. It's like, it doesn't on that period of post on Elvis. I'm just reviewing my, my notes for further further questions. Um, I, you know, oh, I, yes. just, I had to make sure I was prepared here. Um, uh, oh, um, it, okay, this is just a super like basic action question. Is do you think that it's um, cheating to rely on personal life experience, emotional recall, when you're acting in in a story, um, or or do you think it's a, a part of like if you're if you're sitting there acting, you're like, okay, you gotta cry, you gotta cry. Think about when your dog died. Think about think about when your dog died. You got this. You got this. Um, is that cheating? Um, is there such a thing as cheating when you're acting, or is it only about the end product? Is well, it process or product? If it works, it ain't cheating, right? But, yeah. but 
I was I would say this to that. Oh, think about my dog dying. Think about my dog dying. The second you do that, I your hands are tense. Your neck is tense. Your back is tense. You're put. You're forcing something on yourself. You know, I, I've I've played this game with you before, which is if you clench your fists and you clench your neck and you clench your mouth and you squinch down and squinch your toes and you do that, and then I tell you to imagine peeling an orange. You can't do it. You know, and this is this is. You know, if we want to talk about method acting, it's imagination, relaxation, concentration, right? You, you have to be relaxed for the imagination to happen. And you have to be focused on what the story you're trying to tell is, right? So if you're, if you're concentrated, meaning your lines, the text, the metaphor of the play, the world of the universe you're acting in, and you're relaxed, then your imagination can take off and you can really remember peeling an orange and you smell it and you, your fingers get sticky and this part isn't peeling as well and details start to happen. And details are what other people can relate to. Everything's generic and, and so you get into the details of, of human experience. And so when the details start happening, believe it or not, the thought of your dog dying or something, if you're really relaxed and happening, will move you, you, you know? I mean, it, 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 so it's not an effort. And it's this, you know, one of the things I had to cut out of the documentary is Kazan used to have an exercise, which is that you would just take a word or a sentence in your text and really attach emotion to it. I mean, in private, on your own. I have the word dog in my line. And so I will go alone in my room and meditate on my dog. Um, that I loved when my mother brought him home and he was a puppy. And then I remember him being gay and you're thinking about that and you just attach it to that word dog. And I'm telling you, the second that line comes up, that word pops up, this flood of memories just happens. And it's not cheating. It, it's, it's trying to figure out how to invoke hypnosis, right? The job, when you see Nina Simone on stage, she hypnotizes an audience like that. What does she hypnotize them with? Her pain, her reality, her joy, her love, and that comes out in her voice. And so it's trying to connect whatever's real and authentic with you with said instrument. Does that make sense? Totally, totally. I have a follow-up question. I mean, it's great, it's an amazing answer. Um, I have a follow-up question that's, feel free to go slow, because okay. it's, it's dangerous, slightly, ever so slightly. But I, growing up with you and my mom as parents, I watched actors negotiate playing a difficult role with being present in their life as a human being and uh, simultaneously. And actors who are parents, I think, have to do this um, in a way that some actors who are not parents don't have, don't have the same pressure to have to do it. Because if you're a parent, you've got your kid on set even if you have to be screaming and crying um, when the cameras are rolling, when it cuts, you have to go go pick up your baby and be like, hey, everything's okay. Like, this is my job. This is my art. Like, everything's okay. I'm okay. You're okay. Like, and I watched you guys both do that um, for me. And it gave me this impression of what it meant to be an actor um, and that it meant this kind of level of play and this ability to be present in your life at the same time. Um, but in my, and in my life as a professional, that idea has been um, questioned and pushed in different ways, watching other people work differently than that, watching, um, and I, I'm interested in what your, is that, is, it was your decision to do that more about the kind of parent you wanted to be or more about the kind of actor you wanted to be? And how connected are those things? I think when your life is really working, there's an integration. The person I want to be, the dad I want to be, and the artist I want to be are the same thing. And when my life is out of balance, you know, if my focus is too hard on my artistic life, what happens is my personal life is out of balance and therefore throws my artistic life off balance, that it's it's an integrity of all the disparate elements of your life, you know, and that you, you're like, you yourself, and we're like a, a tree or something with this root system and you're gonna draw, you know, you drew water from your mom, you drew water from me, you drew water from your siblings, you drew water from your, 
your, your friendships, from your reading you did, the life you had on your own, and that as you get older, that root system is expanding. And, and that creates balance in your life. When I've been off balance, everything goes out of whack. You, you yeah. and, and it sometimes can briefly manifest in a great performance for, for me. Like, I'll never forget, you know, um, the mistake I made. I invited you to see, you were so falling in love with acting and I was having this amazing experience being directed by Austin Pendleton in Ivanov and I was working on Chekhov and I really view those plays as kind of the hardest thing to do. And so I wanted you to see it. And I completely forgot that my character commits suicide at the end of the play until you in the audience. And I mean, it took you weeks to get over that. It was so upsetting, yeah. That, that but, home was a giant fail as a parent. Well, I, I wouldn't say that. Um, I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, that's not how I remember it. I, I think it was, it was, it was also a, a time where I learned about the boundaries between emotions that are safe and emotions that are not safe. Um, and I think that we've talked about this a lot, whether it comes, when it comes to like, philosophies behind what a horror movies are like, or like art is a space where you get to experience feelings that scare you in a safe environment. Um, and sometimes th that is too far and people get really upset and it's, and it's, and it's, and they sh were in a situation that they shouldn't have been in. But I think the vast majority of experience with art, even art about dark things gives us permission to have feelings about times that we were unsafe and do feel unsafe in an environment that is 100% controlled and we are 100% safe. That's the value of art. I mean, it's, yeah. it's very difficult. You watch it all over the internet, the news, you know, people don't know how to talk about human sexuality, for example. Yeah. Everybody experiences it. We're all aware of it, but talking about it in any way is extremely difficult. The same with issues of faith. Yeah. It mentions God or Buddha or Allah and certain birds of the table shuts down, right? They're, yeah. It's scared. Am I going to be proselytized to? Am I going to, am I, am, is this going to be difficult? But art is the space where human sexuality, things like fear, emotions we don't want to feel, um, all of it, familial troubles, you yeah. know, amazing experiences through the movies of healing in my own family, you know, with my mom and dad, things by seeing a great story about a mother and a father or kids. And you start to go, oh, wow, I'm not so alone. Yeah. And they do that by talking about really scary things, um, but in a safe place. Because it's yeah. not lit, it's edited, there's music playing, it has a beginning, middle, and end. And therefore, we, the audience, get to learn how to navigate our emotional life through our stories. So I do think, I do think, you know, I just thought you were a little young for that, or I thought I didn't prepare you. And I, I, I thought of that one because that's the last time that a character ran away with my life. Mm. Uh, I was off balance. So if I made, if, it, if I'm glad that you don't remember it as hurtful. I'm really glad. But if I made the right decision, it was by accident. D yeah. the, I, I was out of balance. I, I was working really hard. Um, and I really wanted to do a good job, really. And, uh, the, the play ex explores deeply depression and how depression and ego maniacal behavior and megalomaniacal behavior are kind of connected. When you stop being able to see other people and you only see yourself, your ego either goes way up or way down. And totally, yeah, that, that's a great answer. Um, Last question okay. is, um, is much uh, more, is, is very simple, which is that, because I think I hear people talking about this stuff all the time, is when you think about your, with what jobs you're gonna take or not take, do you think broadly about the arc of your career as a whole? Or are you thinking about what you wanna do right now? Like, are you looking at, are you looking at, well, I've never been in a kids movie. I've never done a comedy. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. Or I don't do comedy or, you know, these kind of like pr parameters that people put around themselves or as they plan their, their, their perfect career in their head. Or, or are you just kind of taking it day by day, year by year, project by project? I think like a free Sunday afternoon, 
you have to have a plan and you have to be willing to abandon it. You, you know, it's like, yeah, I really, I do have on my checklist, you just called it out. It's like, I'm looking at what I've done with my life. And I'm like, how have I never done a bald face comedy? Like, I want to do Step Brothers. I want to be like a small part in Talladega Nights. You want to do something like really funny like that. And, but if I stop my life with this agenda to pursue comedy when it's not happening naturally, you know, you got to move with the river a little bit. You know, one of my first movies was with Jeremy Irons. And he, at that time, he just won the Oscar. And it, it was such an honor to be working with him. And he was really brilliant. And he, he said, you have to take risks, but in the parameters of an achievable goal, in the parameters of where you can succeed, push the boundaries of your box a little bit. You don't need to make these grand statements of changing yourself all the time. You can move with the river and be open to change. Um, I, I do, I often think about it. I have these plans about what I want my career to be. And then I just do what makes sense in the moment. And yeah. often, you, you know, I mean, my plans have never turned out. You know, like, do you feel like it's the same with your personal life? Like, I mean, I mean, probably, I mean, there are things about your personal life now that are more kind of defined because you're just, because that's what happens as you get older, as there are things with your career that are more defined because that's what happens as you grow because you have more experience and have made more choices already. But I feel like that's also something that's true about one's personal life is you have this idea, you have these ideas about how it's going to go and they can make you feel gonna... comfortable when you're going to bed at night and then you have no idea what's going to happen. Well, you know, I remember that we, a lot of us as young lay in bed and write in our journal about what your perfect lover is going to be like. Yeah, or you, but, I mean, you know, the kid who sits, you know, two seats down from you at school and you're like, M you know, Mr. Uh, you know, <laughs> like whatever, you make up your own new name. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and, and it's fun and it has no bearing on reality. Yeah. Like, you know, love is something that happens to you, you know, and, and your life happens to you. I've always said, like, you know, like, I remember Linkletter said this to me when I, I, when I met Rick, I was about 24 and I had that, this whole kind of beat philosophy. And I'm like, I've got to go out there and live life and have adventures and have experience. And, and Rick was always like, life's going to happen. Like you're going to have what you need is to read more. Like you need to be smarter. Like don't yeah. be about pursuing drama. Like don't, you don't need to ride motorcycles to Panama to have a life. Like do it if you want, but don't do it for the story you know you can go read motorcycle diaries and kind of absorb that and see what you think and you know it, you don't need to inflict pain on yourself it's gonna come it's gonna come yeah yeah exactly yeah you, you need to learn so that you're prepared with how to think about it and process it in an intelligent way when it happens it's gonna come well um did i pass the test I mean, you just passed the test and I'm just so grateful. Now, instead of, you have to make sure you save this. By the way, we can keep going if you want to. I just, those are the questions that I had written down. Um, well, well, I think this is amazing. I don't want to waste people's time. Clementine just got back from camp. She's Oh God, go deal with Clementine. But that, make sure you got to save this so that it's there forever so that when I get asked what are the best advice my dad's given me, I can just say it's available on his Instagram. Yeah, great. I'll save please, it. Please I won't go look over at it. Okay. Don't take the beginning of this. I, I can finish strong. Great. We should we should start doing this, or we should just keep track of like the most regular questions that we get asked about the other person, and then just like put them on the record, like put the answers out on the record of us talking to each other, and then there can just be a big catalog available. Well, we maybe, don't have to answer any of them anymore. Maybe when your album comes out, I'll interview you. For, I mean, that's a great. I love that idea. Okay. All the people ask me about you. Well, The Last Movie Stars is so good. Everyone should watch it. You've done an amazing job. I learned so much watching you make it. I learned so much talking to you about it. And I learned so much watching it. And I, I cried and it's funny. And the like making it, and it's such a film history lesson at the same time where it's like, you know, it's an incredible film class that takes you through many, many years of filmmaking by looking at specific careers of actors, which is such a kind of a way that I feel like no one in film schools teaches the history of film you don't go to one or two actors and go like what choices did they make in their lives you know even if if you look at it from beginning to end um and it's such an interesting way to learn about film history acting and what it means to live a healthy life as a human being in the arts in the world so thank you for making this i'm so glad to have it as a teacher it's like 
the next chapter of Rules for a Night or something, you know? It's really great. Well, I'm really grateful to ha have a daughter who, uh, who would put on time to help me like this. Thank you, Maya. Oh, I'm not helping you. I love you so much. You're the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right, so I just press here.